Hi guys, hi guys, I welcome you to my YouTube channel, Learning Physics, Physics with IBM. And uh, this is Cambridge AS Physics, I'm solving past papers. I'm solving May, June series, and this is going to be paper 2-2. Two, two. So you must have watched paper 1-1, one, one, and you should now be moving to paper 2-2 two, two, and you compare the concepts. They're almost the same. They have the same level of difficulty, but just in different uh, twisted uh, Formats. So, without wasting time, let's go to the question paper. So, this is the question paper, Cambridge International ASA level. And this is paper uh, 2 AS level structure discussions. Uh, this is 9702-2020, uh, that is 22, May, June 2023. The paper is 1 hour and 15 minutes. So without wasting time, I will not go through the instructions. You can read through the instructions. It is out of 60. Uh, the formula and data given, these ones you are used to them, I will not go through them. Okay, number one, define pressure. Of course, the pressure, pressure is the force acting normally, pint area. The force acting normally, a unit area. So it, the, the force should be normal, or the area should be normal to the force. That is pressure, not just force over area. It is the force acting normally. The force must be acting at right angles to the area for it to exert a pressure. Use the answer to A to show that the SI base units of pressure are kilograms per meters, kilogram per meter per second cubed. So by definition of pressure, as the force acting normally per unit area, we know that the units of force uh, mass, which is kilogram, acceleration, which is meters per second squared, and the area, which is meters squared. So when I combine the two, the units of pressure will be kilogram meters per second squared divided by meters squared, and meters divided by meters squared gives us uh, meters divided by meters squared, that is meters per minus one. So this is kilogram per meter. A second squared as required. A horizontal pipe has length L and cross sectional area of radius R. A liquid of density rho flows through the pipe. The mass M of the liquid flowing through the pipe in time t is given by that expression, where P1 and P2 are the pressures at the ends of the pipe and K is a constant. Determine the SI base units of K. So I'll make K the subject. So k is going to be equal to pi into p2 minus p1 times r power 4 times density times t divide by 8 l times m. That is if I make k the subject. So I'll list the units. To begin with, uh, p2 minus p1 is difference in pressure. And the units will remain the same as those that we have seen above. That is kilogram meters per meter per second squared. Of course, I will not. I can't subtract units. It is P1 times P2, which is difference in pressure. Difference in pressure will have the same units as the pressure of each at each point. Kilogram per meter per second squared. Then R is radius, which is in meters. Then R T is a time which is in seconds then we have l which is length which is in meters and we of course we have density mass over volume which is going to be kilograms per meters cubed so now uh, let's substitute to find the units so k the units of k are going to be we ignore pi so we shall have kilogram uh, per meter per second squared times r power 4 which is going to be meters power 4 times rho which is kilograms per meters cubed then times t which is seconds divide by 8 is a coefficient we ignore 8 l is length which is in meters times m is mass which is kilograms So when we simplify this, 
of course one one kilogram will cancel out but when we simplify this i'll just cancel out one kilogram so you remain with kilogram i'm combining the m's m power minus one times m power four times m power three i add the powers so m power minus one plus minus one plus four plus minus three you get zero so that is m power zero so m cancels in the numerator then you remain with s power minus two times s minus two plus one is minus one so it is s power minus one divided by m so one over m is is going to be m power minus one so the answer here is going to be kilograms m power minus one s power minus one an experiment is performed to determine the value of k by measuring the value of other quantities in the equation in b the value of l and r each have a percentage uncertainty of two percent state and explain the uh, qualitative quantitatively quantitatively it means you must state the quantity which of these two quantities contributes more to the percentage uncertainty in the calculated value of k so when you look at k, r is raised to power 4 and l is raised to power 1. So we have r is raised to power 4 and l is raised to power 1. So which one contributes more? It means the percentage uncertainty in r is going to be 4 times percentage in times 2. And percentage uncertainty in l is just going to be 1 times times 2. So r contributes r contributes 4 times 2%, which is 8%, because it's raised to power 4. And L only contributes. Only contributes 1 times 2%, which is 2%. So R contributes more to the percentage uncertainty in K. Okay, so R will contribute more because it's raised to power 4. State what is meant by the center of gravity. Of course, there's a point where all the weight of a body is considered to act. That is called the center of gravity. So a point where all the weight all the weight of the object all the weight of the object may be considered to act. So that is called the center of gravity. Two blocks are on a horizontal beam that is pivoted at its center of gravity as shown in the figure. A large block of weight 54 newtons is a distance 0 0.45 meters from the pivot. A small block of weight at 22.4 newtons is a distance of 0 0.95 meters from the pivot. And a distance of 0 0.35 meters from the right hand side, from the right hand end of the beam. The right hand end of the beam is connected to the ground by a string that is at an angle of 30 degrees to the horizontal. The beam is in equilibrium. That means the resultant force is zero, the resultant moment is zero. By taking moments about the pivot, calculate the tension T in the string. So the tension T has two components. One is in the vertical. So resolving T in the vertical will be T sine of 30. Resolving T in the horizontal will be T cos of 30. Of course, T cos 30 will have no moment because it acts, it's the, the line, this line is in the horizontal, so it acts through the pivot, so it has no moment. There's no perpendicular distance, but T sine 30 will have a moment and its perpendicular distance is 0 0.35 plus 0 0.95 from the pivot. So T sine 30 is pulling the beam downwards, so that is clockwise. 2.4 newtons is pulling the beam downwards, that is also clockwise. And 54 newtons also pulling the beam downwards, but in an anti-clockwise direction. So 
the sum of moments which are clockwise should be called the sum of moments which are anticlockwise. So we shall say t sine of 30 times the perpendicular distance, which is 0 0.35 plus 0 0.95 plus 2.4 times the perpendicular distance, which is 0 0.45, should give us the anticlockwise moment, which is 54 times 0 0.45. That is the perpendicular distance. So I'll just check with my calculator, um, 54 times 0 0.45. So this is 24.3. Then this one is 2.4 times 0 0.45. This is 1.08. And we have 0 0.35 plus 0 0.95, which is 1.3. So we have T sine of 30 times 1.3 plus 1.08 is equal to that. So I'll just subtract 24. 0.3 minus 1.08 divide by 1.3 divide by sine of 30 so this is giving us 35.7 let me check it again 54 times 0 0.45 is 24.3 minus 2.4 times 0 0.45 so that is 23.22 then uh, divide by divide by 0 0.35 plus 0 0.95 so that is 17 point that again divide by sine of 30 so the, the exact most exact value is going to be 35.7 so t is approximately 35.7 newtons or approximately 36 T sine T is going to be approximately 35.7 or approximately 36 newtons. That is if you use exact values, exact values without rounding off. So that will be the value of T. The string is cut so that the beam is no longer in equilibrium. The beam is no longer in equilibrium. Catch the maximum of the resultant moment about the pivot uh, acting on the beam. So since the string is cut, so it means there will be no tension. The only moments act acting are the ones due to 2.4 and 54 newtons. So uh, the clockwise moments, I will use CW for clockwise moments. We shall have uh, uh, 2.4 times perpendicular distance, which is 0 0.95. And then the ant clockwise moment you have only 54 times the perpendicular distance which is 0 0.45 so we can find the resultant by subtracting the resultant is going to be uh, 54 times 0 0.05 minus 2.4 times 0 0.95 so this is giving us 22.02, which is approximately 22. So I'll take approximately 22 Newton meters. The beam in, in B rotates when the string is cut and the small block of weight, 2.4 Newton, is projected through air. The figure shows the last part of the path of the block before it hits the ground. Okay. Point X is on the path. 
The block has a speed 3.4 meters per second and is at a height of 1.8 meters above, above the ground. So here the speed is 3.4 meters per second at x. Calculate the decrease in the gravitational potential energy of the block for its movement from x to y. So the height is this. So we know that the decrease in gravitational potential energy is equal to mg times the decrease in the height h. So the mass, we had the weight of the block from the previous part, the weight is 2.4, so mg is 2.4. So this is 2.4 times the decrease in height, which is 1.8. And this gives us 2.4 times 1.8, which is 4.3. So this is going to be 4.3. Use your answer to C Roman 1 and the conservation of energy to determine the kinetic energy of the block at Y. So we have the kinetic the, the speed at the other point, and we want to find the kinetic energy at block Y. So when it moves from if this is the decrease in potential energy, it also becomes kinetic energy. But at point X, it also has had kinetic energy. So we can find kinetic energy at X is a half mv squared, which was a half. The mass is the weight divided by G, so it is 2.4 divided by G, which is 9.81. Then the speed at X was 3.4 squared. So a half is 0.5 times 2.4 divided by 9.81 then times 3.4 and this is squared. So uh, the kinetic energy at X is 1.4 joules. Then um, it means kinetic energy at Y will simply be kinetic energy at X plus the decrease in potential energy because the decrease in potential energy also becomes kinetic energy. So plus uh, the change in potential energy, it also becomes kinetic energy. So this means this is going to be 1.4 plus 4.3, which gives us 5.7 joules. So it means the answer here is 5.7 joules. Alternatively, alternatively, you can use as, um, conservation of energy that the gain in kinetic energy at x, which is a half mv squared, will be called the initial kinetic energy, which is a half mu squared plus at the loss in potential energy, which is mg delta H. So of course the mass cancels out. And if the mass cancels out, it means V squared, I multiply everything by 2, it means V squared is going to be U squared plus 2G difference in height H. So uh, this is going to be U squared is 4.3.4 squared plus 2 times 9.81 times the decrease in height, which is 1.8. That is going to give us V squared. And we press our calculator for this. This is another method. So 3.4 squared plus two times 9.81 times 1.8. So this is V squared is 46.876, 46.876, this is V squared. So kinetic energy is going to be a half times the mass, which is 2.4 divided by 9.8 times V squared, which is 46.876. So just multiply this by 0 0.5 for a half times 2.4 divided by 9.81. So still this gives us 55.7 joules. So the answer is 5.7. State the variation if any in the direction of the acceleration of the block as it moves from x to y. Variation. Uh, somewhere here they mentioned and said air resistance is negligible, so it means the acceleration is going to remain constant. So no variation since air resistance is negligible. So there's no variation since air resistance
is negligible. The block passes point X at time Tx and arrives at point Y at time Tr. On the figures 2.3, sketch a graph to show the variation of the magnitude of the horizontal component of velocity of the block with time from Tx to Ty. So since acceleration in the horizontal is always zero, since there is, because there is no force acting in the horizontal, it means the velocity in the horizontal does not change. It remains constant throughout the motion. So there is no change in the velocity in the horizontal because there is no acceleration, no resultant, no force acts in the horizontal. So the velocity remains constant. And if it had a, an initial velocity in the horizontal, then it should remain with the same velocity throughout. So the answer is going to be a horizontal line with a constant, with a zero gradient or horizontal line between T x and ty so the velocity remains constant in the horizontal so that would be a horizontal line if it was a vertical component the, the graph would be going upwards so this is horizontal line we saw the vert the other one for the previous for 2 1 for 2 2 it is a horizontal line okay A block is pulled by a force X in a straight line along a rough horizontal surface as shown in the figure. So this is force X. Assume that the total resistive force opposing the motion is 0 0.8 newtons at all speeds of the block. So it, uh, the resistive force is remaining constant at all speeds. The variation with the T of the magnitude of the force X is shown. Okay, so before we go to force X, so let F be the resultant force. If the body is moving um, in the other direction, the body is moving to the right, it means force, the resultant force is X minus the resistive force, which is 0 0.80. Okay, the variation with time of the magnitude of the force X is shown. So define force. Of course, we know that force is the rate of change of momentum. So this is simply the rate of change of momentum. Force is the rate of change of momentum. Then determine the change in the momentum of the block from time t equals to zero to time t equals three seconds. So since force here, they gave us a graph of force against time. And this force X against time, yet uh, the resultant force is the rate of change of momentum, which is going to be X minus 0 0.8. So the uh, force is equal to the rate of change, the rate of change of momentum. That is the result. But this one is equal to X minus 0 0.80 0, divided by t. Sorry. Not divided by t. So that is equal to that. That means uh, the change in momentum, the change in momentum is going to be equal to x minus 0 0.80, 0, then times t, which is simply the area under the graph. So it is that part there. So the force is equal to x, resultant force is x minus 0 0.8, which is the friction. And it means, and also resultant force is equal to change in momentum over time. So we combine the two equations. So change in momentum over time is going to be x minus 0 0.8. So it means um, the change in momentum is going to be x, what is the value of x? At t equals to zero, x is 1.4. This is 1.4. And of course, this is 0 0.8. So it is going to be 1.4 minus 0 0.8, then times t. We take this t to the right hand side, so times 3, or times 3 minus 0. So when you check with your calculator, 1.4 minus 0 0.8. 
then times 3. So that is 1.8. So the change in momentum is 1.8. Describe and explain the motion of the block between t equals to 3 seconds and t equals to 6 seconds. So remember the resultant force is equal to x minus air resistance, which is 0 0.8. And between t equals to zero, t equals to three, and t equals to six, we see that x is equal to constant. I think x equals to constant and to zero point eight. X equals to zero point eight, which means the resultant force is zero point eight minus zero point eight, which is going to be zero. But remember, the resultant force is equal to mass times acceleration. If AF is zero, it means the acceleration is also zero. So this implies the acceleration is zero. And if the acceleration is zero, it means velocity does not change. Velocity will be constant. Okay, so we simply say that the resultant force, resultant force on the block is zero. I've showed you why the resultant force is zero. The resultant force is x minus 0 0.8, which was friction. But between t equals 3 and t equals 6 from the graph, x is 0 0.8. So the resultant force is zero. Acceleration is zero. So the velocity remains the constant. So velocity is constant. Force X produces a total power of 2.0 watts when moving the block between t equals 3 seconds to t equals 6 seconds. Okay, capture the distance moved by the block during this time interval. Of course we know that power is force times velocity or power is going to be force times the displacement over time. So we want the displacement. So the displacement is going to be power times time divided by the force. So we want uh, we, we are looking at force x. So this is going to be between t equals to 3, the power is given as 2. Between t equals 3 and t equals 6, the time is 3 seconds. And the force between t equals 3 and t equals 6 is 0 0.8. So we just 6 divided by... 6 divided by 0 0.8 is 7.5. So the distance S or the displacement, let me use D for displacement, is 7.5 meters. So the answer here is 7.5 meters. Alternatively, we know that work done is equal to force times distance, and the power is equal to work done divided by time. So it means that the work done is going to be power times time. So it means force times distance should be equal to power times time, which also means that the distance is power times time divided by the force, which is exactly the expression on the left-hand side. So it all gives us 7.5. The block is at rest at time t equals to zero. On the figure, sketch a graph to show the variation of the momentum of the block with time t with time t from t equals to 0 to t equals 6.0 seconds. So let's go back here on the graph. So we're going to sketch a graph of um, momentum against time. So we just look at the expression, force, resultant force, is equal to the change in momentum over time, which is going to be x minus 0 0.8. 
So we want to sketch a graph. Momentum with time. So the change in momentum is equal to x minus 0 0.8 times t. So between t equals to 0 to t equals to 3, um, x is 1.5. So between t equals to 0 to t equals 3, x is not 1.4 newtons, which means the change in momentum is going to be 1.4 minus 0 0.8 times 3, which we calculated as the previous part, we calculated it as 1.8. So it should be 1.8 newton seconds. So the momentum increases from 0 to 1.8 newton seconds. Okay, then between t equals to 3 up to t equals to 6 seconds. We see that x in this case from the graph is 0 0.8 newtons, which means the change in momentum is going to be 0 0.8 minus 0 0.8, then times the time which is 3. The change in momentum is 0, which means the momentum remains, momentum will be constant at that point. So this is going to be a straight line from 0 to 1.8 then it becomes horizontal because after three seconds the momentum remains constant so we shall just draw that graph so our momentum increases up to 1.8 uh, since numerical values were not required i will just draw a line up to one point up to that value here the momentum increases up to a certain value then after three seconds, the momentum remains constant. So this will be a horizontal line. Okay, so that will be our graph. A spring is suspended. A spring is suspended from a fixed point at one end. The spring is extended by a vertical force applied to the other end. The variation to the applied force F with the length L of the spring is shown here. For the spring, state the name of the law given the relationship between the force and the extension. Of course, force and extension that is automatically Hooke's law. Hooke's law. Determine the spring constant in Newton meters. So from we know that uh, from force equals to kx according to Hooke's law, uh, the constant k is equal to the gradient, which is simply going to be equal to change in force that is 12 minus 0 and 24 minus 8. So that is 12 minus 0 divided by 24 minus 8. But this should be multiplied by 10 power minus 2 because it's given in centimeters. So just say 12 divided by 24 minus 8, I think that is 16, divided by 16 exponent minus 2. So that is 75. So this is 75. The answer here is 75. Determine the elastic potential energy when uh, F is 6 newtons, elastic potential energy. We know that elastic potential energy could be the area under the graph, or it could be a half Fx, because it's a triangle. It is the area under the graph, which is a half Fx. It is always the area with the extension axis. So this O, this could be a half Kx squared, if we, are, if we, if we have K. So I'll use the first one. Elastic potential energy will be a half. F is given as 6.0 and the extension. When the force is 6 newtons, L is 16. So the extension is 16 minus 8. Extension is 16 minus 8, which is going to be 8 centimeters. 
so the extension is eight centimeters so it is eight times ten power minus two half is 0 0.5 times six times eight exponent minus two so that is 0 0.24 so the answer is 0 0.24 so this is 0 0.24 Alternatively, you can say energy is equal to a half times k. We, we calculated the k as 75. Then x is still 8, so it is 8 times 10 power minus 2. But this should be squared. If I use a half, kx squared. So this should give you the same answer, 0 0.24. This is another alternative. So the answer is 0 0.24. Question number 3. Now on waves, a progressive wave travels through a medium. The wave causes a particle of the medium to vibrate along a line P. The energy of the wave propagates along line Q. Compare the direction of lines P and Q if the wave is transverse. Of course, if the wave is transverse, the particles vibrate perpendicular. So I'll say they are perpendicular. They are perpendicular. And if the wave is parallel, then they are, if the wave is longitudinal, they are parallel. The vibrations are parallel to the direction of propagation of energy. A tube is closed at one end. A loudspeaker is placed near the other end of the tube as shown in the figure. The loudspeaker emits sound. Of course, when you see uh, there is an antinode and an antinode, then it means there is a node in between, and there will be a node at the closed end. So if I was to sketch a trace here, I think I would have something like, how am I sketching this? So I'll have something like this. So that there's a node here and a node at the extreme end, okay? So determine the wavelength of the sound. They gave us frequency, they have they gave us speed, they want us to find wavelength. So we know that V is lambda F, so lambda is equal to V divided by F. V is 340 divided by F, which is 1700. So 340 divided by 1700, that is 0.20. So this is going to be 0 0.20 meters. Uh, determine the length L of the tube. So we see that in the length of the tube we have a half and a quarter. A half plus a quarter cycles, I think that is 3 over 4 cycles. So that is 3 over 4 lambda. So L is equal to that. A half plus a quarter cycles. So L is 3 over 4 lambda. So I just simply say L is equal to 3 over 4 of wavelength. So this is going to be 3 over 4 times the wavelength which is 0 0.2. 0. So 3 divided by 4 times 0 0.2, that is 0 0.15. So L is 0 0.15 meters. The maximum wavelength of the sound from a loudspeaker that can be produced, that can produce a stationary wave in the tube. Of course, we notice from here that L is directly proportion to wavelength. And If L is directly proportional to wavelength, it means the maximum wavelength of the sound from the loudspeaker that can produce a stationary wave. So it means we are simply going to have uh, the fundamental mode of vibration. That's when we shall have the maximum wavelength. If we want wavelength to be maximum, then it means um, we shall have the fundamental mode so that L, the length of the pipe, is simply a quarter of wavelength. So if the length of the pipe is a quarter of wavelength, it means the wavelength is going to be equal to four times, four times lambda, I mean four times of L. So the maximum wavelength is going to be four times the length of the pipe, which we got as 0 0.15, so this is going to be 0 point, I think that is 0 0.60. I'll check 
4 times 0 0.15, I think that is 0 0.60. So if it was, note that if it was an open pipe on both sides, for maximum wavelength, we shall have the fundamental mode for an open pipe. The fundamental mode is like that, which is a quarter plus a quarter. So L here will be a half of wavelength. So the maximum wavelength in an open pipe is twice L, where yet the maximum wavelength in a closed pipe is 4L. So the answer is 0 0.6. Two polarizing filters are arranged so that their planes are vertical and parallel. Their planes are vertical and parallel. The first filter has its transmission axis at an angle of 30 deg 5 degrees to the, to the vertical. The second filter has its transmission axis at an angle of alpha to the vertical. Angle alpha is greater than 35 degrees and less than 90 degrees. A beam of vertical polarization light of intensity 8.5 watts per meter squared is listed normal on the first filter. So that the intensity of the light transmitted by the first filter is 5.7. So we know that intensity is equal to I naught cos squared theta. So intensity is going to be I naught, which is 8.5 cos squared theta which is 35 and we shall just press our calculator 8.5 cos i'll open the bracket because this is squared 8.5 open the brackets cos of 35 but this should be squared so getting i as 5.70 so this is correct. I is 5.70 watts per meter squared as required. The, the intensity of the light transmitted by the second filter is 5.2 watts per meter squared. Catch the angle alpha. Let's first find the angle through which it has been rotated before we find alpha. The angle it has been moved at, or the angle corresponding to 5.2 from the vertical when the filter is rotated from the vertical. So, well, let's first say theta, let theta be called the angle of the second filter. Angle of the second filter relative relative to the first that is beyond the position of the first beyond position of the first filter so if theta is that then using i is equal to i naught cos squared theta so I is going to be 5.2 because this is what is transmitted, but what is incident was 5.7 cos squared theta. Let's find theta. So theta is going to be cos inverse of the square root of 5.2 divided by 5.7. It is square root because cos is theta, cos, it is cos squared theta, so I have to find the square root first. So this will be 5.2 divided by 5.7, then root of the answer. Then I get the cos inverse of the answer, which is 17.2 or approximately 17 degrees. So theta is equal to 17 degrees. So it means uh, the second filter has been, is, uh, is is the second filter is 17 degrees beyond the position of the first filter which means alpha is going to be 17 plus 35 which gives us 52 degrees so the answer here is going to be 52 here comes electricity the current in a filament lamp decreases Set and explain how the resistance of the lamp changes. The current in the filament lamp decreases. State and explain how the resistance of the lamp changes. 
So we know that in a filament lamp, as current, as temperature increases, the resistance of the filament lamp increases and the current flowing um, remains almost constant. So if the current in the filament lamp decreases, it means that um, the resistance is actually going to be decreasing. So it means the temperature must have decreased. So, so that will explain how the resistance of the lamp changes. So because a smaller current is flowing, it means the temperature decreases. The temperature decreases. And if the temperature decreases, it means the resistance decreases. So and so the resistance decreases. Note that if more current flows in the filament lamp, with the time the temperature increases, so the resistance would increase. A cylindrical wire has length L and resistance R, the total number of free electrons in bracket charge carriers contained in a volume of the wire is N. Each free electron has charge E. The potential difference between the ends of the wire is V. Determine the expressions in terms of some or all of the symbols E, L, N, R, V for the current. By definition, we know that current is going to be potential difference over resistance. So this is automatically V divided by R. Then the average drift speed of the free electrons. We know that I is equal to N A Q times V. And in this case, Q is going to be equal to E. But N is the number density, which is number of free electrons, pi into volume, which is capital V. But of course, we don't have capital, okay, we have capital V here. We have capital V here. Oh, V is not a volume here. V is V is PD, so I'll just write here volume. Pi number of electrons over volume, so which is going to be N over, of course, the volume is cross-sectional area times the length. Cross-sectional area times the length, we don't have area. Okay. Then at the drift speed, if I make V the subject, V is going to be equal to I divided by N A times Q, which is E. So I'm substituting I is V, potential difference over R, divided by N. N is capital N over A L times A times E, so we have divided. Of course, A has cancelled out. So this is giving me V over R times, I get the reciprocal to be L divided by N times E. So it means this gives me V L over R N E. So this is most likely going to be V L over R N E. That is method one. Method two, alternatively, I could say drift speed is equal to distance, length over time. And this is going to be length or distance over time. We know that time is because I is equal to Q over T. It means T is Q over I. So this is going to be Q divided by I. So this, when you simplify this, the I goes up. So it is L times I over Q. But we've already seen what I is. I is V over R. So this is going to be capital V over R. Then divide by Q. Of course, total charge is total charge Q. Q is equal to the number of free electrons times the charge of each electron. So the drift velocity is going to be equal to L V over R divided by Q, which is N times E. When you simplify again, it becomes V times L over the R goes down. So it is R N E. So it is the same thing. Then the average time, the average time taken for uh, a free electron to move along the full length of the wire. So we want time. 
time is of course distance divided by the speed the distance it is going to move is l then the speed we have got it from the above the speed is vl divided by r and e so the r and e goes up so it is l times r and e divided by v l l cancels out so the time is going to be r and e divided by v so it is r and e divided by v alternatively i can use time is charge over current Remember, total charge is the number of free electrons times the charge of each electron. Then over current is V over R. So again, the R goes up, so it becomes R and E divided by V. So this would be another method. So that is the time taken. Another question for electricity. A battery of EMF uh, 9 volts and negligible internal resistance is connected to light dependent resistor and a fixed resistor as shown. So you can see the diagram. The LDR and the fixed resistor have resistances 1,800 ohms and 1,200 ohms. Capture the potential difference across the LDR. So you could decide to find use the potential divider formula that if this is V1 and this is V2 and this is the voltage supply, so it means V1 is going to be equal to R1 of R1 plus R2 times the voltage supply. So if this is R1 and this is R2, you could use that. So I could simply say uh, the PD across the LDR, which I called V1, is going to be the resistance of the LDR, which is R1, 1,800, over total resistance, which is 1,200 plus 1,800 um, times, times 9. This is the potential divider formula. You could use the potential divider formula. The potential is divided in the ratio of the resistances. So this gives us 1,800 divided by 1,800 plus 1,200. That is 0.6, then times 9, which is 5.4. So this would be 5.4 volts. So this is 5.4 volts. Alternatively, you could first find the current. Alternatively, you find the current, which is EMF over total resistance. The EMF is given as 9. Total resistance is 1,800 plus 1,200, which gives us 3,000. That is the current. Then the PD across 1,800 will be I times the resistance R1 where I is 9 over 3,000 3, times R1, which is 1,800. And I'm sure this gives us 5.4 volts. The circuit in A is now modified by adding a uniform resistance wire XY and a galvanometer as shown. So they have added a uniform resistance wire XY. Okay. The length of wire XY is 2 meters, I mean 1.2 meters. The movable connection Z is positioned on the wire XY so that the galvanometer reading is zero. So if there is balance, of course, we know from our electricity skills that potential difference across XZ is the same as PD across 1,800 ohms. And we can compare VXY over total potential difference across XY, which is going to be equal to the PD across, which is going to be um, the PD across, the, it is directly proportional to length XZ over the length XY. So it means if I want the PD across XZ, 
I will get the length xz. It is length xz over length xy times PD across xy, which is the battery EMF, which is going to be 9. So let's see the question. Capture the length xz. So I'll just make lxz the subject. lxz the subject is going to be the PD across xz divided by 9 times the length xy. Oh, alternatively, I would just get the ratio. Maybe this is confusing. I get the ratio of the PDs is equal to the ratio of the lengths. So the PD across XZ divided by the PD across XY, which is 9.0, should be equal to the length XZ divided by the length XY. So the length XZ is going to be the PD across XZ. Of course, we saw the PD across the uh, the, uh, the LDR was 5.4, so it's 5.4 divided by 9. Then times the length xy, which is going to be, I'm cross multiplying, which is 1.2. So I'll say 5.4 divided by 9 times 1.2, which gives us 0.72. So this means the answer is 0.72 meters. The environmental conditions change, causing a decrease in the resistance of the LDR. Temperature of the LDR remains constant. Temperature of the LDR remains constant. Of course, we know that the resistance of the LDR is inversely proportional to the light intensity. Light intensity. So they say the conditions change causing a decrease in resistance. So if resistance decreases, it means the light intensity has increased, the luminosity has increased. So, um, so here it means state whether there is a decrease, increase, or no change. So the intensity of the light illuminating the LDR increases. So this is increases. Then total power. Of course, we know that um, if the resistance has decreased, then the power in the battery, power in the battery is equal to current times E. Total resistance has decreased, the current has decreased. So the power, sorry, total resistance has decreased, the current has increased. Resistance, total resistance decreases. It means the current through the battery has increased. So it means since power is equal to I times E, so it means the power increases. The power increases because the current increases. Then the length X, Z so that the galvanometer reads zero. Note that LXZ is going to be equal to potential difference across XZ divided by the EMF of the cell, divided by the EMF of the cell, which is 9, times the length XY. This one is constant. This one is constant. Now note that The, resist, uh, the resistance has decreased for the light intensity, which means the PD across XZ or the PD across um, XZ is the same as the PD across the LDR. Because the resistance has decreased for the LDR, the PD across the LDR has decreased, meaning the PD XZ has decreased. And if the PDXZ has decreased, it means the length XZ must decrease because the EMF is constant, LXY is constant. So this is a decrease. So we say decreases. Length XZ decreases. Okay. So lastly, I think particle physics is the last question. Nucleus P and nucleus Q are isotopes of the same element. Nucleus uh, Q is unstable and emits beta minus particle to form nucleus R. So Q is giving us R plus beta minus, which is 0 minus 1. For nuclear, nuclei P and Q compare the number of protons because they are isotopes so the number of protons is the same or the number of protons is equal or you can say the same then the number of neutrons p and q 
Of course, it is going to be different because isotopes have the same proton number but different neutron number. So this is different. Or you can say unequal. When nucleus Q decays to form nucleus R, the, the quark composition of a nucleon changes. Of course, whenever beta minus is emitted, it is because a neutron has changed into a proton to give us beta minus. So this is 1, 1, 1, 0. The quark composition, so for neutron, up, down, down, is changing to up, up, down. Instead, they change it to the quark composition of the nucleon. So you could simply say up, down, down, changes to up, up, down. Or you could say a down quark down quark changes to up. State the name of another particle that must be emitted from nucleus Q. Of course, whenever beta minus particle is emitted, it is accompanied by an electron. Because beta minus is a normal particle, it is accompanied by an antiparticle, which is the antineutrino. So it is accompanied by the electron ant. Neutrino. A hadron consists of two charm quarks and one bottom quark. Determine in terms of elementary charge, the charge of the hadron. We know that a charm quark has a charge of positive 2 over 3e, and a bottom quark has a charge of negative 1 over 3e. So we can find total charge. So the charge is going to be plus 2 over 3e plus, because it is charm, charm, uh, bottom, plus 2 over 3e, plus negative 1 over 3e. And, of course, LOCM is 3, so you have 4e minus e, which is 3e over 3e, which is equal to plus 1e. So the charge here is going to be plus 1e. Okay, so that is the end of this paper. I think this was also an easy paper. So I hope you learned it. You, I have 15 extra, around 12 extra minutes. So those ones you can go through your work, but me, I will not go through it because me, I'm a teacher. Okay, so I hope you learned a lot from this paper. Uh, you can always raise your question and you can always write a comment, like the videos. So until next time, until next time, bye-bye.